Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Russell or Ryan, can you just confirm that you can hear me? Can hear. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, I am going to start uh, presenting my screen. Everybody uh, attending, thank you so much for joining. Uh, we appreciate your time this afternoon. My name is Lizzie Glenzer from Fierce Software. You've uh, been getting all those reminder emails and everything from me. I'm going to go ahead and just give a short introduction of who Fierce Software is. If you have not uh, attended an event with us before, I will go ahead and give a quick intro, just why we're here, why we're hosting this event. And then I will go ahead and pass everything over to Russell from Red Hat, who's going to be delivering the content today. All right. All right, can you guys see my screen? I can't see the Blue Jeans app anymore. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay, perfect. All right, so like I said, I'm going to give a, a short intro to who Fear Software is. So we are a small woman-owned business, and we specialize in reselling. So we resell enterprise open source software, such as um, Red Hat Ansible, which you're going to be talking about today. And our focus is for public access public sector customers, excuse me. Um, and we do have a you know, specific focus working with uh, federal system integrators, but today you're gonna be working with our SLED team. So we are a value-added reseller of all of these vendors that you can see here on the right, as well as several other uh, vendors that we work with. But as you can see, we have Red Hat here um, as one of the main vendors that we focus on and you know, develop other technologies around. So I'm sure, you know, as part of this, um, you know, IT community, you guys have worked with resellers before. So I just want to go over what uh, value add fear software offers. So what kind of makes us different is we offer license management, meaning that, you know, what we sell is sold on a yearly basis. So we help track and quote your yearly renewals. Um, so we'll proactively reach out to you. You don't have to worry about tracking of any of that stuff on your own. Uh, we'll make sure that everything is supported and renewed in time for you to have support. We also help with order fulfillment, meaning that we work with the vendor such as Red Hat as well as distribution in the background so that you only have to communicate with us. It kind of makes things easier for you and you just get the quote, place the order and get your uh, subscription started. We also offer software impl implementation. So after you do place your order, we ensure that you're comfortable with the software that you're purchasing. So we do that by you know, workshops, we host webinars like this, we provide professional services to help you get you started if needed. And for our professional services, we do have both cleared and uncleared uh, professionals depending on what our customer needs. Um, you know, so if you did need professional services for Red Hat or Ansible in this case, the professional that you would work with would be trained and certified on whatever software you were needing serviced. So Fear Software is also an innovation broker, meaning that we help work to connect the dots between our vendors to prescribe the best combination of software and or services depending on what our customer needs. So we really like to hear you know, the pain points of our customers, what they're liking, what they're not liking about their current um, you know, DevSecOps or data analytics practices and we can kind of help you piece together what you need um, from a vendor perspective and help you uh, accomplish your goal in the most sensible way possible. And like I said, we also put on custom webinars and workshops such as the one you're going to see today with content, again, tailored around what our customers are wanting. Um, so I know that this was a big request that we had come from Red Hat um, on behalf of their customers. So we, you know, hope you guys enjoyed today. I'm gonna do a short intro of who your Red Hat team is. So like I mentioned, Russell is going to be your main speaker today. Um, we have worked with Russell in the past. He is an awesome speaker. We've had great reviews, so you guys are in for a treat today. We also have Laurel, um, who is your account representative for SLED over at Red Hat. So I will be including this uh, contact information afterwards, but I just wanted to give a quick shout out to them. Uh, before we get started. And I've also included Fierce Software's Red Hat alias. So if you ever have any questions about events and any of the vendors that we represent, you can always reach out there. I also just want to do a quick overview of Red Hat training because that's a big focus that we've had this year. And I think it's really important to Red Hat in general. 
So we actually uh, developed recently our own Red Hat training web store on our website, which you can see a screen grab of here on the left. I've included some stats here on the screen uh, just about you know, some of the great benefits of Red Hat training um, and you know, why organizations should be using Red Hat training. Basically, if you're gonna be making the investment in Red Hat software, it makes sense to have your people trained to the best of their ability to make you know, the most out of your purchase. So on our web store, you can buy any form of Red Hat training, um, including you know, learning subscriptions, training units, and we also have a skills assessment if you're not sure where your team should start. Um, that It's kind of like a placement exam. It'll basically tell you, uh, based on the quiz, where you should start with training. And this is just to say after the workshop, we're gonna be sending you additional details. Like I said, I'll be providing contact information, additional follow-up resources, so you, continue to, you can continue to learn more about Ansible if needed. Um, but with that, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Russell. And just a little bit about the platform. I encourage, obviously, questions from anybody. Um, in BlueJeans, you can't, um, you can't unmute yourself to ask questions. So we encourage you to use the uh, event chat. I can see some people have already in there, looks like confirmed that, that you guys could hear me. So if you have questions for Russell, please either feel free to put them in there as they come up or um, after the event, I'm sure he'll ask and cover that as well. Um, so like I said, I'll pass it over to Russell and... Uh, All righty, can you see my screen? I can and we can hear you perfectly. Okay, uh, just so you know, I uh, don't have great visibility in the chat, so if something comes up, Lizzie, that uh, you feel like interrupting me, go right ahead. Okay, for sure, will do. Okay, so, okay, now that's interesting. I'm in presentation mode, there we go, <laughs> strange things. All right, hopefully you're seeing the agenda. Uh, this is, a, this is gonna be an interesting uh, talk for me, honestly, because uh, uh, I do a lot of talks about Ansible. This is really interesting, trying to take um, the current realities and, uh, and craft them into into the uh, the benefits that we have of Ansible. Uh, as Lizzie said, my name is Russ Pavlicek. I work with Red Hat. I've been here for five years. I've worked with open source software for over a quarter century. Um, so I've been around the block a few times. And uh, so here's a just a list of some of the topics we're going to hit today. First, uh, the notion of you know why automate in the first place. Then what happened last year with the bug, et cetera, and everything that changed because of that. Um, if you're not a uh, you know current Red Hat customer, you may be surprised to find that we are more than just the Linux company we've always been, and that kind of plays into what we're doing here. And then uh, I'll be going through the Ansible automation platform just at a very high level and uh, try to show you how it applies inside this post-COVID or during COVID, however you want to look at it, uh, sled world. So uh, uh, this should be interesting. So I just want to start with the notion of systems thinking. You know, whenever you're trying to get stuff done and you're trying to optimize, you got to find the slowest component. If you optimize the things that are moving fast, you're not going to get the great return. But if you find the slowest component, the thing that's holding you back, that's when you can get uh, that's when you can get something that really starts moving forward. Get rid of that bottleneck, and all sorts of things start happening. Because the bottom line is, you've got stuff in the backlog more than likely. I mean, I talk with customers all the time, and you know, I say, well, do you have stuff in the backlog? Oh yes, of course. You have stuff in the backlog that's been there for a year. Oh yeah, two years. Uh huh. Three years. Mm hmm. -hmm. Things get stuck in the backlog because. Uh, you know, you need resources, you need uh, person power, you need all sorts of things to get them out of that backlog and get them into the work in progress. So we have spent at Red Hat an inordinate amount of time and that analyzing this problem. And we have determined the nature of the problem. The problem is Bob. Yes, Bob, you know Bob. Every time you're trying to get work done, it's Bob who's in the way. When you uh, when you go to the uh, to the systems team, you say, "Oh, well, I need a I need a new VM stood up." It's like, "Oh, yeah, okay. Well, that's Bob's job. 
Bob's awfully busy right now, so we'll put it in a stack and maybe he'll get to it in you know a few days. Or if you have to get the, the new VPN in the network, oh yeah, well that's Bob, all right. Well, you know, as soon as he can get to it, we'll we'll get there. Bob, Bob, Bob is the one. Bob is the one slowing you down. Every time you want something done, it's that darn Bob. Bob's the problem. But wait. Uh Bob is actually your hero. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Bob is the hero. How can that be? Well, think about what Bob does. Bob is the person who specifies the server stack. And then when it's time to build that server, call on Bob because who knows it better than Bob. And then God forbid that thing breaks. Well, you, you need Bob. Bob. Bob's the one. And then when something truly important happens, like the VP needs a laptop installed at the lake house, they send Bob every last time. In fact, Bob does everything. That's why Bob's the hero. But so what's the problem? I mean, heroes are great, right? We, we like heroes. Anyone who spent any time in Marvel Comics or DC Comics knows that heroes are wonderful. And you know how it goes inside the comic books. You got the hero and the most important person in the world steps into the room and says, I need this now. And how does the hero respond? Here I come to save the day. Put in the chat right now if you remember where that came from. It's a hint. It's a rodent. Mighty Mouse. Mighty Mouse. And for an extra five points in the chat, if anyone can tell me, where Mighty Mouse got his superpowers from. Ding! Mighty Mouse got his superpowers from eating cheese at a supermarket. What do you want? It's 1941. How, how inspiring do you want it to be? Okay, back to the story. So the most important person in the world comes in the room and says, I need this now. And the hero takes care of it. But, you know, that's comic books. That's fiction fairy tales. In real life, the two most important people in the world step into the room and say, I need this now, but you only have one hero. But you know, we're not even talking about reality. We're talking IT. And in IT, the six most important people in the world step in the room at the exact same time say, I need this now. And what's the hero going to do? You only got one hero. But, you know, there are other problems with this hero system, like buses. Buses are terrible for heroes. I mean, think about it. Your hero, Bob, just took care of the six most important people in the world. And uh, it's now lunchtime, which for Bob is about 3 o'clock. And he's, uh, he's going outside to try to grab a sandwich really quick. And he's looking down at his phone. And up pops a message from the seventh most important person in the world saying, I need this now. And he's not looking where he's going. And he's stepping out on the curb. And the bus is coming. And bam! No Bob. No Bob. No hero. No hero. No work getting done. And then there's another problem with heroes. Recruiters. Mm -hmm. Recruiters are terrible for heroes because you know how recruiters do. They say, oh, Bob, oh, Bob, we, we hear your hero, Bob. We like heroes, Bob. You know what we like to do with our heroes, Bob? We like to give them money. Do you like money, Bob? Would you like to have lots of money? How about you come work for us and you'll have lots of money. We'll give you all the money. And so Bob goes off with the recruiter. No Bob, no hero, no hero, no work getting done. So how are we going to solve this problem? The hero problem. What do you do? Well, the first thing you might suggest is to enhance the throughput. We'll just reduce the amount of work being done, right? But before you go and suggest that to your boss, make sure that your resume is up to date on LinkedIn because you'll need it when you're out on the street at 5 o'clock looking for a new job. Because in truth, no one can do less. We all need to do more. We have to do more. We have to somehow increase the throughput. So how do we do that? Well, in the world of automation, there is this concept. The concept is called hero as code. Good concept. Take the knowledge of that hero. 
leverage the hero's experience, reduce the amount of repetition that's going on, and reduce it to code. And that will get rid of the variability, all sorts of things. It's great, except most automation, or at least a good part of it, takes place on the operant, operations end of the world. You know, in operations, frequently you got a lot of people who don't like to code. If they wanted to be coders, they would have gone into development. How can you deal with a hero as code when you got people who don't want to code? Well, in the Ansible world, we have a slightly different solution. It's the hero as playbook. Because a playbook isn't code. A playbook is a description of the desired endpoint. In other words, if you can figure if you can fill out a configuration file, you can write a playbook. So if we can take the processes and procedures, like installing the operating system, add a web server, configure the software, reduce it all to playbooks, so we can define the intent, we can set up the policies, it doesn't matter what the architecture is, we can apply it across varying device types, we can actually automate and get things done faster without having to engage the hero. And with this theory and this system, we can actually manage entire life cycles because it's not just about getting some operations tasks done. It's about getting development tasks done and being able to then throw the code over the wall into the testing realm and over and from then to QA and from then, you know, into uh, into production. Because you know, if you uh, you know if you follow a lot of development cycles. Yes, there will be a piece of code that developers will come up with. And then on the other hand, they will have a script to install and test it and say, oh, well, this is what we use here on the development side, and it works just fine. And so they throw it over the wall to the testing people. The testing people say, okay, we've got the piece of code, but this script, this script is designed for the development environment, not for the testing environment. So we have to rewrite the script so it works in the testing environment. And they test it all out, and if it works okay, then they throw it across the wall to the QA people, and the QA people say, okay, we got this piece of code, but now we got this script that fits the testing environment, not the QA environment, so we have to recut this again, and over and over it goes, where, where basically the script has to be written and rewritten, and sometimes things actually get lost in translation. And I have actually uh, heard of things that failed in production not because of the code, but because the translation of that installation and configuration script, it didn't quite cut it as it went from department to department. So if we can manage the entire life cycle with a singular playbook, the same playbook that comes out of development is the same playbook that actually works in production, we can get rid of that problem. In fact, if we think about it, if all of the interested departments, and these are only a handful, are working together and putting their information into playbooks, the turnaround can be amazing. In fact, I was working with a customer a few years ago, that uh, government customer went in and say, well, how long does it take for you right now to provision a virtual machine? And they said, oh, about 14 working days. And it's like, um, you know, provisioning a virtual machine shouldn't take 14 working days. It can be done a lot quicker than that. Oh, yes, we know. But you see, first we have to go to the systems group, and so we have to fill out the forms, and we have to put it in there, and we have to wait for their hero to come around and actually take care of that. And then we have to go over to the networking group and get something set up so it's on the right VPN. And we got to wait for that to happen and so forth. And then we got to go to the storage group. So they're going from one group to another. And in truth, every group has their own hero. It's not one hero that you're trying to get rid of. You're trying to get rid of all these heroes, at least as far as getting work done. And the things you're not trying to get rid of them, unless there be heroes online saying, oh my gosh, he's trying to take my job. No, 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 no. We're actually trying to get you to be able to do the things that you were hired to do. Because when you hire smart people, you want them to do smart things. You don't want to be, you don't want them to be taking out the trash and doing the laundry and doing other things. No, there are people that can do that. Here, you've got this big brain. We hired you to do some particularly wonderful things. Go do it. 
So if we take away a lot of the mundane tasks and automate them, that's with the intent of giving the hero more heroic things to do. And that's where we are. So if we can communicate with playbooks, and in fact, this customer that I mentioned, you know, came in and it was 14 uh, working days, we got them down to a few minutes. You know, the size of a quick coffee break between the point that the, the uh, request is submitted and they're looking at access information to use their new VM. And that's the way it should be because we need to get rid of these roadblocks. We need to get rid of the things that are in the way. Now, lots of things happened here this past year. In fact, I'd say that this past year has struck home for most organizations the absolute need for automation because certain things, certain old saws in this industry were struck down. Now, you can't see me, and that's to your benefit because who the heck wants to look at me? But I've been in this industry for decades, for quite a while. And there's a lot of, well, we've always done it this way, that just gets protected and reworked year after year. In fact, you know, you could have that old ox cart that is just sort of rumbling along. And, you know, a lot of innovation historically is, uh, oh, we'll, we'll grease the wheels on the ox cart. Well, how about we get rid of the ox cart and buy a truck? What about if we put this thing on a plane? This is sort of where we need to be. So in the past 18 months or so, the whole COVID crisis has done a lot to, to change the way we must think to get work done. We, we dealt with truly lights out data centers, a lot of us. In other words, people weren't even allowed in the building. You know, the whole lights out data center concept is about probably 20 odd years old at this point, but it was absolutely true last year and maybe even true where you are today for all I know, if things are you know changing up in different ways. But when you physically can't put people in the building, you need to find a different way. Your hero not only has to worry about, you know, buses and recruiters, they could be sick. They could be unavailable for weeks. What do you do? The whole notion of the having the on-site staff. Now, of course, in the cloud world, we're used to that not being the case, but Truth is that most, most organizations have some things in the cloud and some things on-prem. And for the longest time, for my entire time in this industry, the notion of having someone there in the room that you can call, say, get this done, that's, that was always there. And if, if it came down to it, it's a 3 a.m. phone call. I have received them myself in my deep, dark past. This thing is bust, busted, get in here before People show up because your job is on the line. But in truth, we found out this past year that the notion of always having the availability of on-site staff, that notion is broken. It is a luxury. We need a different way to think about this. We've always done it this way, died a very sorrowful death because you can't do it the way we did. We had to come up with new rules. And it's not just about, once again, it's not just about coping with what we've seen. It's about coping with the next one and the next one. Well, what do you mean? Well, no one anticipated this, or at least no one I've talked to anticipated this. In all truth, there's probably another one. And I'm not talking about another COVID. I'm talking about another crisis. You know, what happens if something happens with uh, one of the major clouds and they just go away? Are you prepared if that's part of your infrastructure? Can you move something? I mean, so there's this whole question in the air. How do we deal with crisis? How do we rethink the job of IT so we can keep going even when major disasters occur? You know, and maybe you made it through 2020 and you're looking back and say, oh, this was cool. We did all right. Yeah, it was hard and we had to come up with stuff, but it was good. And that's wonderful. Believe me, survival is a grand thing. But now is the time to look at this and say, okay, did you just band-aid to get through? 
or did you spend the time rethinking? Now, Band-Aids are fine, particularly when you're bleeding, and there was a lot of bleeding going on in the industry, so naturally, a lot of people pasted things together. Bravo, that was what was needed. But now's the time to try to say, should we rethink this? Should we be doing more differently so the next time something whacks us in the side of the head, we recover quickly and not rely on the Band-Aids because the Band-Aids might, they may, may have worked last year, maybe they won't work, work next year if something else happens next year or 10 years from now, or whatever it is. So we need to do a rethink at the very minimum we need to make sure that work can be done remotely. We can't ensure that people are going to be in-house. We have to try to take the standard processes and, re and put them in a repeatable form so that if the hero's not there, the work still gets done. We need to remove that hero's presence from the repeatable tasks. Why? Because when things are coming off the, off the uh, wheels, your hero's busy. Your hero's trying to figure out what should we do. So you don't want them being bogged down with the day-to-day -day stuff. You want that stuff to be able to be handled, ideally by junior staff who somehow are handed something so they can safely execute the tasks that need to be done with no risk, or at least minimal risk. Now, as we think about that, let me just uh, do a quick back step for folks who maybe haven't been following Red Hat that much. And just to start by saying, uh, we ain't just a Linux company. Oh, we're a Linux company. And we are, I think, the best Linux company. But we're not just a Linux company anymore. Now, we actually have many products. This is just kind of like our big three at the moment. But there's middleware. There's all sorts of great stuff out there. But you see there, Enterprise Linux on the left, which is the product that pretty much everyone in the industry knows about. But on the right, we have the Ansible automation platform on the bottom. That's what we're going to be talking about here in the next. next. And there's also the OpenShift container platform. Basically, all of this together, and you see in that little title at the top, fits in a, a vision that we have called the Open Hybrid Cloud. And frankly, the open hybrid cloud is not a buzzword. It's not, uh, you know, the technology du jour. It is a vision that we've had basically longer than just about anyone in this industry. This notion that to have a resilient IT experience, we need to be able to do what we need to do wherever we need to do whenever we need to do it. So in the open hybrid cloud, the concept is that maybe you got some stuff on-prem, maybe you got some stuff in a public cloud, maybe in a second public cloud, maybe in a private cloud like OpenStack, maybe got others. But, you, but these things are going to have to change. And in the face of a crisis, they may have to change fast. You don't have time to go through weeks of migration. And part of the beauty of the open hybrid cloud concept is that wherever wherever your work is, you can move it, you can groove it, and you can keep going. So Red Hat's a lot more than Linux these days. If you if you haven't been uh, you know watching us, but we're going to talk for the next few minutes, particularly about the notion of the Ansible automation platform. So here's a very brief introduction. I'm going to keep this at a high level because. I know we've got a mix of folks. And I'm going to try to run through this relatively quickly, too, because I know that time is precious. I've got a bunch of slides here. I want to make sure we try to cover as much content as we can. So Ansible automation has multiple parts. And uh, the gray section there on the bottom of the right is the, auto is the Ansible engine. And the three pillars there are simple, powerful, and agentless. And then on top of it, there is the tower. And the tower is the way that it gets operationalized, it's the way it becomes controlled, it's the way that it becomes something that a, an agency can use agency-wide or, an, or an enterprise can use corporate-wide. And the three pillars there are control, delegation, and scale. So this is the way that we can make sure that we can take 
these automation playbooks that we talk about and make sure that it works across the agency or across the enterprise. Now, in a lot of organizations, automation is happening in silos. You know, you got one group that's doing Ansible, another one that's doing some sort of scripting, another one's using some sort of config tool. You know, there's all sorts of things going on. But is this kind of organic automation enough? The problem is that when you have them individual like that, you end up with stovepipes. And then you've got the problem that we saw a few slides ago where every group has a different way of doing things. And you're constantly waiting for the hero or maybe the person to hit the script. If we had a singular way to approach this, we can get it so it's fast and reliable. Now, why would Ansible fit that? First, as I said, here's the three pillars, simple, powerful, agentless, simple. Simple, if you look at an Ansible playbook, you're handed an Ansible playbook, within minutes, you can know exactly what it is and what the steps are. It's designed that way. It's meant to be human readable. It is not code, that's another one. As I said before, it's more like filling out a configuration file. Um, and it is, as I said, since it is uh, self-documenting, it's pretty easy to figure out what's going on. Tasks are executed in a linear order, so there's no surprises about that. And every team can do this. This is not something for just developers or just ops staff or just the networking people or whatever. Any team can deal with this. The second tower is powerful. It doesn't matter if it's simple if it doesn't do what you want. Well, Ansible is incredibly powerful when it comes to automation because it doesn't matter whether you're doing app deployment, configuration deployment, workflow orchestration, or a big area for us, network automation. It wasn't actually part of the initial design, but people realized, wait a sec, this is fantastic for networks. If you dealt with the networking side of things at all, you know that there are a lot of places that are still kind of going about changing uh, switches and whatnot, network switches, configuring things by hand like they did 30 years ago when I was poking around various parts of the industry. But with Ansible, we can apply the same things that we do to servers to network automation. We can apply the same thing to a lot of the storage automation out there. So, I mean, it's incredibly powerful and it helps to orchestrate the entire life cycle. And then the third pillar is agentless. Agentless is so important, especially for those of us who are dealing with the, uh, you know, the Fed sled world, where there's constantly an emphasis on security. And if you got these agents, well, who's going to test them? Who's going to make sure they're updated? Who's going to? Those are real questions. They're very good questions. So Ansible is designed not to use agents. Instead, we use things like OpenSSH, WinRM for Windows. By the way. This is not just a Linux play. Like I said, we can do networking and storage, but also we can do Windows. We can do Unix. We can do a lot of things, quite honestly. So there's no agents to exploit or update. We're just using the standard protocols that are there so you can get started immediately and get to work immediately. In fact, Ansible as a company, uh, it, it was purchased by Red Hat, but one of the first um, customers that Ansible, the company, had was, uh, was an organization that had already deployed another automation scheme, but that automation scheme had agents, and they had like, you know, a thousand plus machines out there, and they said, well, we have to update these agents. How do we do it? We can't use our own automation to update the agents. So they actually bought Ansible to update the agents of the auto, other automation play. And it probably doesn't come as a surprise to find out that after a while, they pretty much stopped using that other automation. They started just working with Ansible because it was just easier, agentless, a lot less headaches. So what can you actually do with Ansible? Well, maybe it's easier to say what you can't, I don't know, but it doesn't matter whether you're, whether you're doing orchestration or configuration management, whether you're provisioning, doing continuous delivery, and then, as I said, it's more than just something on a server. It's firewalls and load balancers and 
containers, storage, networking devices, clouds, all these things. All these things can be worked with Ansible. So going back to the whole question of, you know, organic automation, it's much more powerful when all the teams are using the same tool and working together to make sure that everything's working in unison and that one thing can be called by another. And that's how, like the customer I had, went from 14 days to provision of VM to a few minutes because they're all on the same page. They're all using the same automation. Now, the Ansible automation platform has three tiers. The lower tier is called Ansible Engine. That's the thing that actually runs the playbook. The middle tier is called Ansible Tower. And that's kind of the control mechanism. That's the thing that can that has the logging. It has the GUI. It has all the various things that you need to make a truly enterprise or agency worthy. And then you've got the SaaS layer. And this is kind of the new and growing area. And in fact, we're having Ansible Fest next month. There's a whole bunch of new stuff coming out then too i you know advise you to get in on that that's both virtual and free we'll talk about that in just a couple of minutes but uh these various layers together help bring about a more cohesive automation platform so you can get work done and as it says there at the bottom everything everything that red hat does is open source we do not do proprietary code this is all open source. Now, Ansible can touch just about any of the technologies that you're using. And in fact, as you look here, uh, you see anything from various clouds to uh, network vendors to security systems, you name it. And even within uh, Windows, we've got about 100 different modules that deal with various parts of Windows, virtualization and storage. All these various things Ansible can touch and make your life just a whole lot easier. Here's some obligatory numbers for the numbers folks among us. 146% ROI on tower and less than three months payback, according to uh, uh, this particular report. Reduction in recovery time, et cetera. Some big numbers. Well, where, how did these big numbers come about? Well, it's because we're not changing the technology per se, we're changing the personal approach so the technology can get the speed that's always been there, but the, the notion of, well, we'll just keep doing it the same old way we've always been, just moves out of the way so we can get stuff done. So here's the highlights of, of Ansible Engine. It's cross-platform, we said before. It doesn't matter whether it's Linux or Windows or AIX or HPUX or some even strange things. It doesn't matter whether you're working in the cloud or virtual environment, physical environment. It's human readable, as I said before. Um, it's uh, incredibly easy to figure out what's going on. It is a perfect description of the application. It's not code. You're not if then elsing do this, but not then do that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's normally pretty straightforward. There are, are capabilities for conditional things, but that's not normally the way you work. Uh, we have things called modules, and that's where the smarts are. Uh, I'm not going to go into that too much because I'm trying to keep this at a high level. It is version controlled. So if you're deploying uh, your new application version 7 and it happens to fall over, you can pull out the application version 6 de deployment playbooks and roll over top of them and get back to something that's stable again. Really useful. Dynamic inventories. Uh, one of the reasons why a playbook can go through an entire life cycle where a script frequently cannot is that a script, generally speaking, um, you know, it's got uh, the names of the servers, the IP addresses, whatever it is that they're trying to touch. Well, playbooks don't have that. Instead, we refer to inventories. And these inventories can be stored in files, that's a static inventory, or, can, or they can be querying a source of truth. Like, okay, let's say you're, you're using the Amazon cloud. You can do a, have a query to the cloud saying, I need all the machines that are marked human resources, that are marked web server, and that are marked development. That query comes back, 
and there's your list of machines that Amazon provided. But all this is happening under the covers because all we have to do is put the query into Tower. So anytime anyone actually needs to say, well, I need the HR machines in development uh, that are web servers, um, it's all transparent because it's all now built in as part of the dynamic inventory. And then finally, it's orchestration that plays well with others. This is not rip and replace. This is not, oh, here's the shiny new tool. Now take all your other tools that you've been using for the past five years and throw them in the trash and then rework everything that you've done. No, no, no. With Ansible, it's more like filling the gaps. What are you not doing well now? Start there. What are your manual processes? Start automating them. And then later, if you want to, you can change out the things that are already working, make them Ansible, or just leave them as is. We don't care. We play well with others. Now let's talk about Tower. Tower, as I said before, is the orchestration layer. It's the thing that organizes it and makes it you know, uh, enterprise-wide or agency-wide. First off, it's very push-button. It's a web-based GUI. Uh, but it also has another part, which is a RESTful API. So it can be integrated into all the other processes that you already have existing in your system. Like if you've got ServiceNow or Rem Remedy or some ticketing system or something else. If you need to integrate it, you can integrate it. And the API is fully functional. It's not some sort of cut down, bare bones, sort of works, sort of, sort of thing. We've got RBAC, the whole notion of you know role-based access baked into it so people can only see what they're supposed to see touch what they're supposed to touch it keeps it safe it keeps people by roles by what team they're on by what projects they're allowed to see and then there's the whole notion of enterprise integration so that you know if you've got authorization systems and everything like most most organizations do we play with that we don't say oh no you can't do that no we want to integrate with all of that and we have a lot of work there that's already in place to make sure that we can use it, you can use it in your environment. Centralized logging. Of course, one of the big things, particularly those of us who are working in the government space, is you want to make sure that everything's logged. Who did what, when, where, how did it result? Was it success, was it failure? What was the output? What are the log files? All of this is stored within Tower. So you have that complete auditability there. Plus, we can actually use external logging. If, there, if you already have you know, a centralized logging server, we can tie into that. It works incredibly well. And then finally, the whole notion of a workflow, which is once you have playbooks that do certain things, like maybe you have a playbook that uh, uh, loads up uh, an operating system, and then you have another playbook that loads up a web server, and then you've got another playbook that customizes something or other, well, you can have them all work together sequentially in what's known as a workflow. So from these very simple tasks, you can make incredibly complex tasks without having to sit and somehow recode everything in a script or anything like that. It's actually incredibly simple. The Ansible automation platform, as we've seen, this is kind of more of a graphic of some of the things that we've already discussed. But the tower level, you got the simple user interface, you've got the API, you've got the role-based access, the middle level there with the, the engine. This is the stuff that actually does the work as far as the playbook is concerned. And we can reach into all these various parts of the enterprise, whether it's infrastructure or networking, security, cloud, all these various pieces. Plus, there is this newer area called the automation hub. Believe me, there's a lot of good stuff coming here uh, already. Uh, there's quite a bit there, but there's a bunch more coming inside this with this next release upcoming in the next few weeks. Uh, you really want to see that where you can take the these things that are critical to your organization and you can store them in the automation hub. And, uh, uh, you know, it's kind of a way to make it shareable, to make it go across the entire organization so you don't have different groups doing different things different ways, uh, really powerful stuff. Job templates. Now, these are some of the concepts that you'd see if you're running through the tower. Uh, a template is just a combination of a playbook, 
with an inventory, an inventory being the environment it runs in, the credentials, the credentials to actually access the machines, and then it's grouped together in what's known as a project, which is somewhat self-explanatory. So one of the beauties about this is that you can have a an operator execute a template to do a backup or whatever it is, and if that operator were to prove to be um, uh, incompetent or uh, untrustworthy, and you decide, well, we're going to fire this person, they can't then go running out if they were working with, uh, you know, some of your Amazon instances. And if you forgot to uh, change a bunch of the keys, uh, you know, you find that you're uh, mining Bitcoin by morning and you've got some sort of incredible bill uh, out there from, from a vengeful person. In fact, because all of this is stored in the tower, the credentials are in the tower, etc. Once the person is gone, all you need to do is using the RBAC control saying, this person is no longer has access. And there's literally nothing they can do because they don't know how to touch anything in the environment. They just know how to push the button that says run this. They don't have the passwords. They don't have the credentials. Now inventories, as I, as I mentioned, it's the group of machines, which could be servers, it could be network devices, uh, any number of things. And within the inventory, we have concepts of groups. So in other words, we can just say for all the web servers, install, uh, you know, upgrade this, this package. Well, from one environment to another, the group of the machines that are the web servers changes entirely. But in the playbook, it just knows, oh, the group called web servers. I don't care what's there, just go do that. And that's one of the beauties of this. So it then relies uh, on other things. There's inventory specific data, I'm not gonna get into this, but really, uh, really very flexible and powerful. There's the notion of, as I mentioned before, credentials. So that could be the logins to various machines. It could be the keys uh, for, uh, you know, thinking uh, into machines or going into a cloud. The keys to the cloud could be there, et cetera, or various clouds. So all of this is stored internally. It's encrypted. It's, you know, it's stored away from eyes. And you can manage it all from one place. So if a, if a login has to change, all you have to do is change it in the tower in the credentials section, and everything that relies on it is going to work just fine. There's the notion of projects, kind of self-explanatory, really. We all know kind of what a project is. Project is just saying, well, there's these tasks that we're going to do. We're going to give them a name of this project, and then we're going to assign a team to this project, and the, the various people on the team have various roles. Some people can change things. Other people can execute things. Some people can just look at things. So that's a, a great uh, concept as well. And then through that, that brings out the whole notion of playbook management. So whatever you have for a, for a source code management, like you know Git or Mercurial, all that would be managed from the project itself so that it can access those repositories, get stuff done. RESTful API, is, as I mentioned, you know, it's that way that you can integrate Tower with the rest of your organization. And it's uh, you know very, very powerful uh, because anything that you can do in the GUI, you can do in the API and vice versa, at least to about 98%. And if it's 2% off, it probably will be uh, corrected inside the, the next release. The idea is full power, both places, same time. Role-based access control, as I already said, Users have rights, they belong to certain teams, they are restricted according to the role within their team, what projects they can see, what they can do on each one. Enterprise authentication, as I mentioned earlier. So if you've got you know, LDAP servers, you've got uh, Microsoft AD servers or the Azure AD server, all these various things can be integrated easily and seamlessly within the tower. Centralized logging, as I mentioned, if you have that, um, if you have that logging server somewhere inside your uh, your network where you try to keep all your logs filed together, so you can, you know, do Splunk or whatever to search for things, we can play with that as well. Workflows, as I mentioned, kind of an eye chart here. 
but if you can actually see there on the right hand side there's little boxes each of those little boxes is actually a playbook and it literally is a drag and drop and connect the dots of well i want this playbook that's going to install the server here then i want this playbook that's going to assign the vpn here and then i want to be able to uh, add this piece of software and Green lines are, if successful, do this. Red lines are, if not successful, do that. Well, why do you have red lines? Well, if you're working in a public cloud or a paid cloud, you don't want some sort of build operation to fail for who knows what reason, and then leave expensive artifacts out there that are costing you money. So you need to have, you need to have a red line. You need to have a way to back down when done. Uh, webhooks and enabling GitOps for, for organizations pushing that way, absolutely. We've got it so that changes inside your Git repo can make all sorts of differences automatically inside, uh, inside your Ansible flow. And of course, scale. It doesn't make any difference whether something does great things. If it doesn't scale out, it's no darn good. And we absolutely scale out with Ansible. And then workflow automation, I made slight allusion to this earlier, but if you've got a ticketing system, and so you've got a ticket that requests, I need to build this environment. Well, maybe you have a person that says, oh, that's okay, checks the box. Maybe you have an automated thing where it's like, if it's a developer and they only want this size environment automatically approved, well, you can tie Ansible into the ticketing system so that basically the ticketing system talks to Ansible, kicks off the process, the process runs, deploys whatever has to be deployed, and then Ansible can, can come back and integrate with the ticketing system to fill out, yes, job completed, here are the IP addresses, here's the access information, whatever it is that came out of that. Incredibly powerful stuff. Uh, our services organization deals with this quite a bit. Now, we've seen a lot of things that work real well, I think, inside the SLED world, but let's take a look at a few interesting statistics and in an example or two. 87.5% of U.S. executive departments rely on Ansible Automation Platform, 83% of the Fortune 500. 73.9% of commercial banks, et cetera. So big institutions are betting big on Ansible. Why? Because it works. Now, here's a case study, and uh, there's the, the tiny URL there. Don't worry if you can't pen it down or whatever. Uh, inside the follow-up email from the Fierce folks, they're going to have a link to this. But this is, uh, I think this is actually pretty new. I think it's only been put out for the last few days, actually. Emory University. Now they had a they had a security issue, and they had to remediate. Well, they estimated for them to remediate their 500 or so uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux servers. It would take them approximately two weeks. Well, if you've got a major security hole, you don't want your machines to be exposed for two weeks till they all get dealt with. So they went with Ansible, and in approximately four hours, start to finish, they had it done. And here you see some, uh, some of the statements uh, from the manager of systems engineering. People didn't think we could patch Linux servers every 30 days, but it's possible and it's necessary because of Ansible. And as, as he also says, when you're taking, when you allow Ansible to take care of the routine stuff, it gives you more time. It frees people to work on other more critical projects. And that's kind of a key inside the, the COVID world or the post-COVID world or however you want to say it. You want your smart people freed up to do the smart things. You want the machines to take care of the things that, that can be automated. That's kind of the Ansible concept. Here's some more numbers. Five-year ROA, 498%. This is from a, an IDC white paper. 
68% faster deployment of storage resources, $1.13 million additional revenue in the study that was done here, 53% reduction in unplanned downtime. This is real stuff. This is real world. This isn't pie in the sky. Now, I mentioned before, one month away, it's virtual. It's free. Ansible Fest 2021. There are some great things coming, which I am not allowed to say, because if I do, I don't get a paycheck anymore, and I kind of like getting paid. I mean, you're wonderful people, but I'm going for the paycheck. So I'm not going to break the shell too, too soon, but if you just Google Ansible Fest 2021, you go right to the, I think it's ansible.com slash AnsibleFest page. You can sign up. As I said, it's free. The travel's right. There is none. And what's more, even if you're if you're busy on those days, you can actually watch the recorded stuff afterwards. And there's going to be a ton, a ton of interesting things going on there. Not only use cases and uh, individual groups that talk about how they used it successfully, but there's a bunch of new announcements and stuff. You don't want to miss this. Get that on your on your. Uh, on your schedules if you're at all interested in Ansible because that's going to be a major trip. You're going to want to see that. So here, uh, as I'm finishing up, there's the whole notion of why fear software. As it turns out, uh, you know, we kind of covered that at the beginning, so I won't uh, I won't deal with that uh, too much here except to say that, you know, we at Red Hat, we appreciate the folks at Fierce and what they're able to do. And they're, they're right with us in this. So if you have questions about what you heard today, if you have uh, you want to investigate things uh, further, please check in with the Fierce people. Uh, they will help you. And there's the company profile slide that you saw earlier. So I've pretty much hit the wall here. But uh, Lizzie, are there uh, any questions that uh, I should be addressing at this point? I don't think I missed any questions. Um... I did have one person ask about a copy of the webinar presentation. They're just so in, in case anybody didn't see that, we did we are recording this presentation and we'll be hosting it on our YouTube channel. Um, so you'll be able to see it there. Um, I don't think we have any more questions, so I think we're all good. But if anything comes up afterwards to the attendees, uh, you can just respond to the follow-up email that I'll be getting out hopefully this afternoon or tomorrow morning, and I will certainly pass you over uh, to Russell. Totally. But, um, yeah, I think we can go ahead and, and wrap up. Russell, thank you so much for doing this presentation today. As always, it was amazing and incredibly entertaining. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you to all the attendees. I really appreciate your time and coming out today um, and take uh, keep a lookout for that uh, follow-up uh, email and let me know if you need anything in the meantime. <laughs>